on the, the science and culture in the nuclear age. Uh, I, we, we've had a, uh, a request to learn something about the strong nuclear force but from one of our listeners. And uh, we're, we're going to attempt to do that in the quickest possible way because I think it's a, a rabbit hole which you can come down and, ne and never get out of if you get in too deeply. But, we're, but, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll make an attempt to, uh, to do that. And uh, I think uh, now I, I'll just turn it over to Fred Gregory and, uh, and uh, let him begin his, his lecture. Okay, thank you, John. If we don't, if we don't answer that question sufficiently, <clears throat> there will be a time at the end where we will give an attempt. But I'm going to try and include some information on that. So let me begin here by starting. And I need to have you confirm. Is that everybody see that? Yes. Got it. OK, terrific. All right. Well, I have a little quiz for you at the very beginning here. It's a total aside. But uh, we were talking about quantum mechanics. And uh, I just wanted to try and there's a picture. Now it's fuzzy because it's old. But can anybody identify this person right here? And there's no reason why you should be able to. But if you wanted to guess from the previous lectures, that is Werner Heisenberg at uh, an older age that was taken in 74. Anybody have any idea who this is? Can you see my cursor? That is yours truly in 1974. <laughs> so we didn't look the same way we do now. And uh, I just uh, found that old picture and I thought, I bet you they'd enjoy seeing that. So uh, I put it, I had taken a group of students uh, to we, where I was. I was teaching at Eisenhower College in upstate New York. And the way that uh, was uh, that institution arranged its academic year was to have what they called a January independent study term, GIST we called it. And that just for the month of January, the students took one course. And uh, so profs were encouraged to be very creative in the course that they created. And in addition to that, a lot of them, including myself, decided to take a trip. So that involved organizing, of course, and that was a big part of it. But so I took a group of students to Germany. And well, yeah, we were in, and we may have been in Holland as well. But, but we were visiting science museums uh, over the course of that time. And so in advance of that, I wrote to Werner Heisenberg, who was at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. And I said, um, any chance that we could come and talk to you? And he wrote back, which shocked me. And he said, sure, come. And so we arranged it. And we spent, uh, spent a few hours with him uh, one morning, which I thought was an incredible privilege. Uh, and we talked about lots of stuff. And so that, that was fun. At any rate, today we're going to be talking about thermonuclear war, the horrible prospect of it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think you'll agree that that did, well, let's put it this way. When Zeus warned Prometheus not to give humans divine gifts, and Prometheus disobeyed by giving fire to mortals, uh, that warning seem to be very prescient of humans won't know what to do with this. You know, they're, they're going to screw it up. Well, <clears throat> he did give us fire, presumably. And whether or not we screwed it up is, of course, one of those questions about humanity that is yet unanswered. Uh, it's the same thing about science. It's incredible. And it can give you many wonderful things. And it also has a, a side to it that can be exploited for not wonderful things. And so if there was any doubt about Zeus's warning, it evaporated in 1945 when that gift of fire unleashed untold misery on the Japanese for sure. And that's what happened. So what I want to do today in our talk is to discuss three things, two mainly, but we're going to be talking about, you know, last week we concluded that fission was impossible, splitting the atom was impossible. And so obviously we know that did happen. So how did that happen? That's the first thing we want to talk about. 
And then the second is a little bit about the Manhattan Project. That's kind of sandwiched between my two major concerns, namely how did fission happen? And then how did we get to the fusion bomb, which is the hydrogen bomb, the Manhattan Project produced the atomic bomb. And I'll continue to make that distinction between it. Now, from our last lecture, we learned that Henri Becquerel at the end of the 19th century showed that uranium produced these strange rays. And then we also saw that Pierre and Marie Curie discovered radium did that same thing. It produced these strange rays. And uh, just after the turn of the century, uh, Rutherford and Sadi showed that radioactivity, which is what it became known as, uh, involved the decay of one atom into another that was lower on the periodic table. So uranium's down here at 92 protons in its nucleus, and it decays into thorium, which has only 90. And so uh, that was at the beginning, just at the beginning of the century. But then as we also saw in the last lecture, roughly a decade later in England, Rutherford learned how to isolate one of the particles that was in that radioactivity, the so-called alpha radiation. And that was what he then identified as an alpha particle, which had this mass of four, atomic mass of four, and a charge of plus two. Now, he didn't know what that was yet uh, when he discovered it. He just knew it was a very heavy particle. And uh, he used it to fire at gold foil here. It was in his scattering experiments. He fired these particles and then got the scattering. And we talked about how that led to the Bohr atom uh, the, with the positively charged nucleus uh, concentrated in the middle, rather than Thompson had this, this model of the atom in which you had the positive charge spread all over the surface, but that wouldn't be consistent with the results of those scattering experiments. And so the only thing that would is if you had the positive charge concentrated in a single place so that you could explain why when an alpha particle came toward the, the atom, it was able to bounce all the way back you know, almost back directly at uh, the firing mechanism. But uh, so scientists are now just beginning to, to discover how radioactivity in particular governs how unstable heavy nuclei find stable arrangements by adjusting their neutron proton ratio. Now we're gonna talk more about that in a second here, but that's, they don't know a lot about what they're dealing with, but they're gradually starting to learn. So how do they do this? Well, they do it uh, by several means. Here's uranium emitting an alpha and a beta particle, a beta particle is essentially a, an electron. Um, and it, this is how it becomes thorium. So over here is the uranium nucleus. It has 92 protons and 146 neutrons. So the total of the atomic weight would be 238. And then it radiates alpha radiation, which is giving off an alpha particle. Now, the reason you see that there is because we learn later that an alpha particle is essentially a helium nucleus. It's one that has two protons and two neutrons, right? And so what that's left with is then you, you got rid of two protons from here. So that, that means you're now thorium because thorium has 90 protons and that's two less than uranium and 234, uh, well, 142 neutrons. And so that would give you a thorium atom uh, when you do that. And so that's what's going on in, in radioactivity, at least. So now they won't realize until much later that this kind of an interaction would be identified as one of the four fundamental interactions. And scientists these days, physicists anyway, sometimes prefer to talk about interactions rather than forces, but they use the words interchangeably frequently. So one of the four fundamental forces of nature the other three being electromagnetism and the strong nuclear force and gravity. Now here's the four fundamental forces. The first one of course is gravity. That's that, that interaction between big masses, huge masses in comparison with the nuclear size. And the other one, the next one is electromagnetism. Now this was known as electrical force for a long time and magnetic force, they were thought to be separate but then in, as we saw, uh, Orsted and Faraday and Maxwell 
figure out that they're really one force that uh, they're, they're interconnected, they act together. And so electromagnetism became, and right now it's in the 19th century, it's not being talked about as one of the four fundamental forces because the, the people don't really know that. Now, what we're talking about here with radioactivity is called the weak nuclear force. And it's the kind of interaction that governs how unstable nuclei, like uranium, for example, that's very unstable. So it is essentially seeking a more stable arrangement. And so it will continue to decay. Uh, thorium goes to another daughter element, and then that will keep going down until it comes to lead, which is extremely stable. And that is the end of the radioactive decay. So the weak nuclear force is the third of these four fundamental forces. And the strong nuclear force is the last one. The strong nuclear force is what keeps protons together in the nucleus because protons have a positive charge. Well, positive you know, repels itself. Positive charges repel. And so if you got them packed in that close proximity, something must be holding them in there. Now, it's what scientists call the strong nuclear force. And it turns out that it's a very, very short range force. That is, it doesn't act over a very much distance at all. Well, first of all, it doesn't have very much distance to go, right? If it's packed into a nucleus, it's confined. Uh, but if you, if you uh, compare it to how electromagnetism or certainly gravity works, gravity is a long range force. It can work over, you know, eons of space, but uh, um, the strong nuclear force is a very short range force. Now, this Rutherford Bohr atom, as it was indicated, which had the electrons orbiting a positively charged nucleus uh, was known. And Rutherford himself had come into circumstances where the masses that were involved in the nucleus seemed to be unexplainably heavy. And he had predicted that there's probably going to be another particle somehow in the nucleus. And that was confirmed in 1932 when James Chadwick uh, showed that there was a neutron in the nucleus. Uh, so if you have radioactive decay due to alpha radiation an alpha particles given off, and we just saw, for example, two protons and two neutrons, that was a process that was known because Rutherford had seen that, and that was the alpha particle that had been around a long time. Now, remember, the alpha particle is a plus two charge because the neutrons, they are neutral, and so they don't have a charge. But those alpha particles are plus two charge as you're firing them at the, nu at the nucleus. And the nucleus, of course, is made up of protons, which is also positively charged. So that's a fairly heavy particle that you're firing at it, but it does encounter resistance as it gets close. So um, they, they were familiar with alpha radiation and Irene Curie, was, who was Marie's daughter, seemed to be uh, dealing with an alpha particle in 1937 when she was firing them at uranium. And she thought this is what she was getting, thorium and an alpha particle. But then she tried using the neutron because now that the neutron had been discovered and you could figure out how to use it as a bullet, that's a much better bullet, right? Because it's not positively charged. So as it goes toward the positively charged nucleus, it's not gonna feel that uh, repulsion. So when she fired this neutron at a uranium nucleus, now remember that uranium nucleus is very unstable. And so here goes, the thing goes in there and it encounters it. And the results of that experiment were hard to figure out. The first thing she thought was that the nucleus had absorbed the neutron. You know, well, that's not unimaginable. But the year later, over in Germany, an Otto Hahn, who was a chemist, and Lisa Meitner, who was a physicist, were repeating this experiment by Irene Curie using neutrons to bombard uranium. So Hahn and Meitner had been collaborating for many years. And in 1938, Meitner's Jewish identity finally caught up with her. Now, she had been okay prior to that, even though you would have thought that that would have been a problem. And it was to an extent. Uh, Han periodically had to kind of protect her from some things, but she was an Austrian citizen to prior to the Anschluss and when uh, Germany and Austria were united, uh, her 
foreign citizenship protected her from the German laws, anti-Semitic laws. And so she wasn't, she was able to continue working there, uh, which wouldn't have been the case if she had been a German citizen. But at any rate, it finally got impossible again because of the, uh, the Anschluss, there's a normal word for an English, the connection to the, well, I'm trying to think of the word, you know what it means when you tack on another country to your, your country. That then became, she became a German citizen then, and now she has problems. And so she basically had to leave. And Han uh, helped her to escape. First, she went to uh, Berlin, to Amsterdam, and then she ended up in Sweden, uh, in a lab up in Sweden, which was not something she really, oh, well, obviously she didn't want to leave because they had been working for years and years on these kinds of uh, nuclear experiments. And uh, she was very gifted physicist and they needed each other because the one was a chemist and the other was a physicist. And you kind of see, remember Rutherford said when he came up with the uh, Rutherford Bohr model of the atom, um, he was given a Nobel prize and he said, um, and it was given, he was given it in, in physics, I believe. And he, he said that overnight I became a physicist. I've been a chemist all my life. And so you can see how closely connected these two things are. Uh, and when you're talking about nuclear science, they still are uh, very closely connected. And they're, you know, they're the people in the chemistry department, physics department still collaborate on things like that. So Han and his assistant were getting a three hour, well, it's a three and a half hour radioactive reaction when they were doing, repeating Irene's experiments. And they suspected that this reaction was producing, remember, she couldn't figure out what it was that the, that the experiment was producing at the end of it. And so they suspected they were getting an isotope of uranium. I'm sorry, of radium. So when they were gonna try and collect whatever it was they were getting from this reaction, they used a barium carrier. The Curies had done this as well. And that's because there is some that, well, barium and uranium are in the same uh, family in the periodic table. And so they, they used a barium carrier because of the similarities of chemistry, of the chemistry of uranium and barium. And that, that was gonna be used as a carrier to bring out whatever it was that they had produced. And the Curies had done that when they discovered radium. Because you can see here, barium and radium are in the same, uh, whatever this is, group, I guess. Uh, and so that's why you do this. And it would help you to, uh, isolate, you can deal with barium, uh, which is much more stable than uranium. And so you use a barium carrier that helps you to bring out whatever it is that you produced by bombarding these things. They couldn't explain why the only thing they could collect after the reaction was done seemed to be like barium itself, which they had, you know, they had introduced as a carrier. And so they said, we get nothing, but there's something there. And so we can't figure it out. Unless, unless somehow they had split uranium into barium and krypton. All right, now that would explain why they were getting the barium. Now there's uranium. And if they split barium and krypton into barium and krypton, you could see that that would be, that sum of 56 and 36 is gonna get, give you 92. So that means that uranium had been split, but they don't want to go there. I mean, that that's just like, we don't have a choice because we got something. We can't figure out why it's not barium. And that's the best we can do is to suggest that somehow this was barium. And that, that had the implication that they had split uranium and introduced more barium into the result. But that was impossible because the only thing anyone had done up to that point was to chip off pieces of the nucleus in radioactive decay. The idea that you could somehow figure out how to split the nucleus would take in a force that they just did not understand could be possible. This wasn't radioactive radioactivity. This was a total different kind of reaction. And this was, this was splitting or rupture. But how possibly could one break what had to be an enormous binding force holding the proton so close together in the nucleus? How could you do that? I mean, they were, they were convinced that this was physically impossible. And so it was nice, but on the other hand, 
you know, they got something here. This is a case where the scientist doesn't know what to do. They spent a lot of time doing this. And by this time, Meitner was not present anymore. She was in Sweden. And uh, his assistant, Hans' assistant, was named Strassmann. And the two of them, they didn't want to throw out the stuff they'd done. So in December of 1938, Han wrote to Meitner in Sweden and, and said, we understand that it really can't break up into barium. So try to think of some other possibility because they had worked so closely together and Meitner's the physicist. You can see the, the chemist in, in Han wants to say, it's got to be, no, it's been, what, what's going on here? Meitner's reply was pretty fascinating, I think. We have no experience, we have experienced so many surprises in nuclear physics that one cannot say without hesitation about anything that it's impossible, right? And that's kind of where science needs to be on occasion, where they say, okay, we got to, you know, clear the drawing board here and we're going to entertain. We're at a, we're at a standstill. We, we've got to be wide open to possibility. So think outside the box, right? Han would have preferred if Meitner could have suggested something, but he also didn't want to wait for others to scoop him because he'd done these experiments. And so the, the, the decision he had, he and Strassman had was, do we publish this or do we just sit on it until we figure something out? And he wanted to not sit on it. And so he sent off an article to Die Naturwissenschaften, which was a German scientific journal in December of uh, 1938. And he also sent a copy of that article to Meitner. And in the article, he was careful to say that as chemists, he and his colleagues concluded that the product was not radium, which some had suggested, but barium itself. Now, he said as chemists, because he knows that physically it's not possible, right? So, and he knows, he knows the physicists are going to jump all over him. So that's why that phrase as chemists is in there. I'm telling you what I see. I know it's not physically possible is the implication, but here's what we got. Now you got to tell me why I'm wrong. This was to cover himself from physicists who were sure to point out that his claim was physically impossible. So Meitner had an idea that might explain why barium resulted. Cause we know uranium is very unstable nucleus. So assuming that the force holding the protons together in the nucleus, that is the strong nuclear force, was a short range force. Maybe if the neutron penetrates it, it could distort its shape. And if that's the case, it might even be able to separate the nucleus. Now she's thinking outside the box, obviously, but there had been circulating Bohr had for reasons that I don't, don't know, I might've learned it at one point, but for reasons that, that whatever his reasons were, Bohr had suggested that the nucleus was like a liquid drop. And so if you have a proton coming in to an unstable nucleus, then it could distort its shape if, there's, if, if it could, let's say, if it could distort its shape and then that short, you know, separate it sufficiently so that sh this extremely short range nuclear, strong nuclear force got separated enough, it might be able to break that. Now, that, that was kind of far-fetched, but on the other hand, that was gonna be one of the major reasons why later on when you do know what fission is, um, you need slow neutrons. You need slow neutrons. You, you gotta slow them down in order to make fission happen. They can't be too fast. If they're too fast, it just gets absorbed or it just doesn't do anything. Right, and that's why U two thirty eight is not doesn't work for one reason. But at any rate, um, I think of this this way: if you if you are in a plane, um, and let's say you are over the ocean and you're not very high up, you're you know like say, well if you're let's say you're two hundred feet above the water, and you jump out, you're going to have a problem when you hit the water. It's going to be like hitting solid, right? But if you're not so far up, then when you hit the water, you might be able to slide into it. So if you're, if you're coming at it slower, you can slide in. But if you come at it really fast, which you would be if you're going from a higher, from heights, 
then then you're going to encounter problems. But so if you have a slow neutron, it's going to be able to distort that. Well, that's the theory. You're going to be able to distort it, and then the nucleus would split. Well, her 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 nephew. This was in Christmas time in 1938, and her nephew Robert Frisch was also a physicist. And he was visiting her in Sweden. And they were worked out a scenario that, that unpacked this idea that, Han, uh, that Meitner had during a walk in the snow. I think he was on uh, skis, you know, cross country skis. They were out in the snow and she's explaining this to him. And like anything, you know, when you explain something to something, somebody else, sometimes it becomes clearer in your mind what's possible. And so uh, she sat down on a something there and, and took out some paper and started working out things because Meitner had been working on this stuff so long and she was so gifted that she knew how nucleons were packed into the nucleus. That is in a stable, in a stable nucleus, in a stable atom, like let's say uh, lead uh, or even barium for that matter, the, the nucleons, that is nucleons being protons and neutrons together called nucleons as a group, they can be packed tightly if it's stable. But when they're not packed tightly, then they're, then they're unstable. And so she knew the packing fractions of the nuclei. She'd been working on this stuff so long and Frisch was amazed that she knew these off the top of her head. And so she knew the packing fractions, the uranium nucleus, is loosely packed. Barium was stable and densely packed. And so she sat down on a log and worked out that the sum of the masses of the barium and krypton, now we know that we've accounted for the protons, right? But the sum of the masses, both barium and krypton are tightly packed. She calculated what those two individual masses were and then compared that to the mass of the uh, uranium and the total mass of the original uranium was one fifth of a proton more. So where had that mass gone? And then it hit her. It must have been converted into energy according to Einstein's formula of E equals mc squared. Now, if that's the case, if you have even one fifth of a proton being converted from mass into energy, uh, you can see what this C squared number is gonna to do to any mass at all. That's a huge number, 186,000 miles per second. You know, It's a large number and you square that and you're gonna get a lot of energy that's gonna be released if this process is what doing what it. So that'd be far greater amount of energy than had ever been encountered in any kind of radioactive uh, nuclear reaction when you just kind of leak off alpha particles or something like this. This was a totally different beast. And the energy that's produced is enormous per nuclear event, let's say. So when Frisch got back to England, he did some measurements and confirmed that Meitner's calculation of the energy release was what Meitner had calculated. She had estimated it would be somewhere around 200 million electron volts. And uh, that's what he got. So he obviously was really eager to tell her about that. And Bohr learned about Meitner's insight just as he was preparing to leave for the United States. And he was on this boat and he had a colleague um, from Princeton. Oh no, he was going to Princeton. And uh, he mistakenly trusted this colleague with this new information. And of course, when the guy got to Princeton, he couldn't contain himself and leaked it. And as things will happen within a week, there was a diagram of a bomb on the board of the office of Robin ha Robert Oppenheimer in California. So that's, that's the magnitude of this news that got out because otherwise, how are you going to explain Hahn and Strassman and Meitner's experiment when they bombarded uranium and seemed to get barium out of it? Well, uh, the story of the Manhattan Project then now you, you confirm that fission is possible and there's no way around it and that a lot of energy is released. And so we're in the middle uh, in 1938 of the threatening prospect for war uh, and both militaries are vastly interested in any new, uh, any new element, any new weapon they could get. And so they had a hard time believing these guys when they were talking about it because you know the 
the prospect of releasing this information is, is really a dangerous one. And a number of the scientists saw this. And when they, some of them were approached by the military and they said, well, you know, you, you guys really ought to know about this. And so they described it to them. They didn't really get it. You know, one guy says, can you put it in a gun? Yeah, right. You don't want to put this in a gun. You're not going to be around to see how it fires. But, but at any rate, uh, they had to learn a lot now because first of all, they're on the, the, just on the very edge of having learned that you can get this enormous production of energy. Uh, and, and so in April, that uh, they confirmed that there was a byproduct of this fission reaction, which was the release of more neutrons. Well, if that's the case and you have uranium and somehow you've been able to bombard it and get a, a product of barium and krypton and you get more neutrons, if those neutrons then go and encounter more uranium and then that happens again, so that obviously is going to give you the possibility of a chain reaction. So every time you encounter this, you can see what's happening here. So you're going to have an atomic explosion. And then the Manhattan Project gets underway, and they, they learn about critical mass. That is, how much uranium do you have to have before you can actually produce a chain reaction? Uh, and they, they learn the details about that. Um, they learn a whole lot of other stuff that, that you have to know, but then they're confronted with the prospect of producing one of these, which is a whole another set of challenges. In other words, you've got the theoretical knowledge of how to do it, but then the actual knowledge of how to build it. And so they came up with two designs. One was uh, you get the critical mass by ramming together two sources of uranium in what was called the gun approach. And, and that you know, they were at two different ends and you rammed them together. And then that would give you the critical mass to start the explosion. And once you get it going, then it's off and gone. The other one was an implosion technique where you, you have um, uranium in a sphere essentially. And then you have charges that are arranged all the way around the sphere that detonate simultaneously. And they implode that and create the critical mass at the center of the first one was the first technique was the one that was used at Hiroshima. And the second one was at Nagasaki. Uh, the first one was called a little boy and the second one was called fat man because that, that sphere they developed for the second one was, uh, <coughs> was a you know, big fat thing. And so uh, <coughs> that led to the actual deployment of the bomb. There's so much involved in that that it would get us a little bit sidetracked if our focus today is on thermonuclear. Uh, hydrogen bombs. That's why I didn't want to say a lot more about it, but I'm sure there's a lot of you who know a lot about the Manhattan Project, and we can explore some of those things when we get um, <clears throat> to the question period. Okay, well, the complication here is that in 1949, the Russians expl explode their own atomic bomb, and that story is, is its, its own story about how they got the information, etc. And theirs was called Joe One, and it, it yielded about the same as the um, I believe the Nagasaki bomb, around 20 kilotons of TNT is equivalent. Uh, and so the, the, the Russians then have the same bomb that we have and we're into an arms race that uh, doesn't stop. All right, that was just the first bomb. That's the fission bomb. You get that? Um, yeah, there's the, the, the yields on the, the two American atomic bombs. Uh, <clears throat> And so it, all this time, Edward Teller had wanted to move on to use what he called the super. The super would be a fusion bomb. Now in the late 30s, the, the, the process of the sun's energy had been explored by physicists and the conversion of hydrogen into helium, uh, which happens on the sun and produces its enormous heat source, um, they had been studying this. And so, of course, Teller wants to say, well, you know, that's a much more powerful yield than a mere 20 kilotons. Um, and so we should be doing that. Well, whether or not he wanted to, that was the next thing on the docket after the 
production of the atomic bomb. And in the production of the atomic bomb, there's a bunch of labs that are created, one at Oak Ridge and another in uh, Hanford in Washington. Uh, and they also learned about <clears throat> how to produce the fissionable material. In other words, the, the types of the isotopes of uranium that work for fission are U-235. In other words, you have um, three protons left, less, not three protons, three neutrons less in the nucleus than the U-238, which is the uranium ore. 99 point something percent of a uranium ore is U-238. But that doesn't fission. Um, but U-235, which is an isotope in uranium ore, I believe is like 0.7 tenths of a percent. So this is a fairly rare um, form of uranium, but that's what you need. So you have to ramp up labs that know, and not only labs, but you know, production sites that produce this. And in the course of doing that, they learned how to produce plutonium, which was also a highly fissionable form that you could use. That was pretty much done at Hanford in Washington state, uh, plutonium bombs. But uh, they learn all this stuff. And so then when you turn from splitting the atom into combining, that is fusing together hydrogen nuclei. So we're on the other end of the periodic table. Uranium is very heavy. Hydrogen is the lightest element. It has one proton in its nucleus. But there is a heavier form called deuterium, which has a neutron in addition to the proton. And then there's even another form called tritium, which has three uh, atomic weight, that is one proton and two neutrons. And if you could jam them together, you get a, a helium nucleus, which is two and two, and one proton given off. Plus, in the process of doing that, you get enormous amounts of energy. And that is from the same source as you got it when you split the atom. In other words, in this process of jamming these two together, you will get a product, but there is some mass in this whole arrangement that's converted into energy. Now, the trick is here, this to do this takes a lot of energy to do it. So you have to use a lot of energy to get a lot of energy, right? That's the reason, incidentally, why when we talk about the peaceful use of either atomic fission or atomic fusion, uh, this one would yield a whole lot more energy if we could figure out how to make it pros profitable. In other words, it costs so much energy to put into this, we don't get enough out that we can control in order to make the, the whole endeavor worthwhile. Uh, for a bomb, you don't have to worry about particulars and controls and all the rest of that. So you can do it there because you, you really don't care. But if you wanna produce it for peaceful uses, then fusion reactors are still on the drawing boards. And there are some people that say we'll do it and some people that say we'll never do it. In other words, we, we have to use so much energy to fuse these that it's not profitable to get the amount of energy out. But if we can ever figure out this, uh, then we will be able to produce all the energy we need. So down the road, we'll, a lot of these things would become mute in terms of supplying energy for the future if we could perfect fusion reactor, reactors. But and this is what's going on here, right? So uh, the amount of energy you get out of this per nuclear event is much more than you get out of a fission uh, per nuclear event. Um, the 200 million electron volts that uh, <clears throat> Frisch, well, that, that Meitner calculated you would get out of splitting the atom is dwarfed by what you would get per nuclear event if you were able to fuse it. But the problem is then, how are you gonna do this? How are you gonna get enough energy to build a bomb to jam these two together in order to get the tremendous explosion that you want. Well, the way to do that is to use the atomic bomb as a matchstick, right? It takes so much energy. That's what the sun does. So where could you possibly find the amount of energy? The answer is use an atomic bomb as a starter to create a 
thermonuclear bomb. So that's what that's what the super design was, and that's what work went into right away. That is, can we do that? Can we build in a little atomic bomb which would produce this great amount of heat, which would then jam together hydrogen nuclei isotopes, and they in turn would then release incredible amounts of energy. And the thing about the fusion bomb is that once the reaction starts, it just keeps going. And it all depends on how much fusible material you have. It'll just keep going. In other words, it's not gonna stop. So you gotta, you gotta take that into account. And one of the big worries about this was that there's a lot of hydrogen in the atmosphere. If we do this, if we start doing this, it, if, it sets a, if it starts fusing the hydrogen in the atmosphere, we're done for, or we're gonna just blow up the world. You know, that was a calculation that, that was worried about at the time. Uh, but nevertheless, they persuaded themselves that that was not going to happen. And in the fall of 1952, the US detonated Ivy Mike uh, over one of the islands making up the Anawitak Atoll in the Pacific. And now we're not talking about kilotons, we're talking about megatons of TNT, right? So this, this island just was kind of obliterated by this. Uh, then, in not that much later, three years later, the Soviets test their hydrogen thermonuclear bomb, and they didn't get that same kind of a, of a yield, but uh, that, that was pretty much <clears throat> puts us into a kind of arms race that we don't really enjoy being in, but nevertheless, we kind of have to be there because of the way things have developed. Now we're gonna explore next time how weather politics is capable, was capable, and is it going to remain being capable of, of containing this arms race, all right? We'll take a look at uh, some of the developments in the military that uh, tried to contain it, and we'll ask the questions about that. So, but before we do it next week, actually, we're gonna look at the impact that all of this stuff had on the public and in, on the arts in particular, namely on literature and on movies. Uh, the prospect now of thermonuclear hydrogen, that is, uh, bombs and what they might portend for life on earth and the, as reflected in literary sources and as reflected in film. Okay, so that'll be the subject for next week. But I'll stop talking now and uh, Lance or John or whoever's going to monitor questions, I'm sure there's going to be some. Okay, I, I guess uh, I'm the, the, the one that can take over. Um, and I will, I will, I'll begin by, by uh, telling you that from 1955 to 1960, I was at the University of California, Berkeley. And my thesis advisor was a man named Burris Cunningham. Uh, he's, he's not particularly uh, famous, but he worked with Fermi in Chicago. And he was, the, he was a microchemist. And he was the first person to uh, make plutonium metal and to determine its properties. And he did this with microgram quantities of plutonium. He was, a, he was an extremely nice man. I was lucky to be able to, to work with him. Uh, but at that same time in Berkeley, uh, we had people who were involved intimately with the uh, uh, development of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, we had uh, uh, Glenn Seaborg who discovered Neptunium. Uh, 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 and uh, along with Magellan, and, and they also went on to discover plutonium. And uh, we also had at that time Teller. Teller came to Teller came to, to Berkeley, and uh, E.O. Lawrence was had died, but he he was the founder of uh, of this whole nuclear physics. A project at University of California, and, and, and so the Lawrence, Lawrence Laboratory was the nuclear 
part of the uh, uh, physics department that I, I actually uh, was was involved with, and there was a lot of uh, the, the 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 physics department was divided into two camps. One which uh, was very proud of the fact that they had made nuclear uh, thermonuclear weapons, and one which thought it was a terrible idea. All of them that worked in in the original Manhattan Project that I that I had listened to and and talked with were justified working on making the original. Uh, uh, atomic bombs because they were they were not at all sure that Werner Heisenberg, who you had lunch with, wasn't also making uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, in Germany. That that could he was certainly smart enough to to uh, understand all the physics that, that was involved, and and they were never sure, even though Bohr had had met with Heisenberg. And, and came away deciding that Heisenberg was not making nuclear weapons. Uh, 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 there, were, there were people in the United States that didn't believe that Heisenberg was telling Bohr the truth. So th th they, they, were, they were very proud of the fact that they, that they uh, did this. But it was Teller who, who was so determined to make a thermonuclear weapon because he now was worried that Russia was going to also try to make a thermonuclear weapon. And, and so there was this artificial kind of uh, competition between what Teller thought the Russians were doing and what the Russians were actually doing, which then brought this new round of, of, uh, of competition. And so there were, people, there were people who didn't talk to one another in the physics department because they were in these opposite, these opposite camps. But, uh, but the, 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 the people that, I, I just wanna reemphasize that the people that worked in the original Manhattan Project, all of them that I knew, were, were very proud to have done that. And, and most of them there, then were in their late 40s and early 50s. And I had a feeling that they had done the work of their lifetime and everything else was, they were, they were just there uh, uh, not trying to do so much new physics. They, they felt that they had done the physics, the most important physics of their lifetime. So that was a, that was an interesting uh, uh, time to be there. I, I I've had I had classes from Seaborg and Macmillan. I, I would see Edward Teller often in the books in the bookstore uh, that that I went to. Uh, he was uh, he 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 looked uh, he looked like he was maybe. 70 years old at the time that, 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 that I was there. He, he, was, he was in his, he was, he was actually in his uh, late 40s or early 50s at that time. But, 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 and he lived a long time after that. Yeah. But, 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 but he, he, he was a, uh, he, he, he was a very de determined man uh, who, uh, uh, what was I'm certain very proud of what he did. Oh, well, there's no question in my mind about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's right. I'd like us to keep our eye too on on the larger picture and how, how unavoidable uh, the arms race was. Once you do something, uh, they, there was there was an attempt in the 40s to put um, atomic uh, science and then nuclear science in general under an uh, international rubric uh, and uh, of an atomic energy commission, right? But in order to, and the way it was drawn up, it required that um, <clears throat> no more nuclear bombs be built and that a nation would have to surrender sovereignty 
to this agency where anything nuclear was concerned. And the Russians were not going to go along with that because they said, you've got it. You have a monopoly. We don't trust you, et cetera. It was just kind of not a possibility because of human beings being who they are. And then, of course, it gets once one person has it, or one country has it, the other yeah. one is going to get it. And that's what happens, of course. And uh, then the question is, how do you contain it? And so we'll take a look at that down the road a bit. But um, at any rate, thank you, John, for that. That That is, Teller spoke here at the University of Florida. Uh, I remember going to hear him. Uh, and he's famous for being the most hawkish of hawks that you can be on nuclear bombs. <laughs> yes. So. And, and, and Oppenheimer was, was against the going to head to make uh, thermonuclear nuclear weapons. Yeah, he was and, against And that, that caused uh, a, a, a big rift between them and, and Oppenheimer uh, lost much of his respect of, of one whole class of, 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 of physicists and, and indeed uh, of the hawks in, in, the, uh, in the administration. They, they no. thought he was pro-Russian and so on. So. Well, he, he had been a communist at yes. one point, but he never had yes. joined the party, I guess. He'd been sympathetic. They could document that he yes. was sympathetic. At any rate, under the McCarthy era, uh, Oppenheimer was uh, cited by the McCarthy Commission, and one of their key witnesses was Teller, who more or less betrayed him. Yes. And, uh, because he never was a member of the party, and obviously had devoted himself to his country when he worked on the atomic bomb and yeah. then opposed the hybrid, you know, thermonuclear bomb, as John says. So that's not a very pleasant uh, aspect of Teller, who was just a very dogmatic guy. At any rate, okay, I'm sure there's other questions. David yes. Hughes, or somebody. Uh, yeah, so there are a few people with their hands raised. Uh, I'm so sorry if I messed up names, but I think uh, David Pollitcher has their hand up. You got my name pretty perfectly. Uh, thank you for that talk. Uh, just one question about <clears throat> Meitner and Hahn's experiments with uranium. So they detected barium, but no mention was made of krypton early on, right. was, although it was later theorized. Is that because krypton is a clear odorless gas and they just didn't detect it? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Anybody know? I don't know the answer. I've often kind of wondered what happens to Krypton in all these discussions, because it's never mentioned, but that's that's a very good idea that you just raised there. Um, yeah, anyway. Krypton, of course, is a, is, is a noble gas, which doesn't have very much chemistry. So I think that I think that made it difficult to to uh, to do the chemical identification of Krypton. Yeah, very good question, though. Yes, yeah. thank you. Anybody else? Uh, next up, we have we have a few questions in the chat, so I'm just pulling those up. We have one from Bob Vernstein that says, "How well do we understand gravity and the strong nuclear force?" Well, the strong nuclear gravity is actually the weakest of the forces. Uh, the strong nuclear force may be the strongest. I think they go down then from there. Let's see, is electromag I'm, I'm trying to, either electromagnetism is the third most powerful and the weak nuclear forces after gravity. Gravity, how do we understand it? Well, after Einstein, of course, gravity, the discussion of gravity changes what? It changes paradigms, I guess, in that gravity becomes a property of space, um, which incidentally it had been under Descartes back in the 17th century. Uh, Descartes saw the explanation for why things fell was because the space was filled with this vortex that put pressure on it, etc. But he made, he explained gravity because of spatial properties. And that's what Einstein does. Einstein says it's a property of space. And, and uh, so the, the whole climate changes in terms of how, but if you want to ask the question, if you want to call gravity a, a pulling force, do we understand how that works? Well, there are people, even as we speak, trying to detect gravity waves, et cetera. Um, but the bottom line is, no, we don't really understand that. We know how to 
to manipulate it. And that's due to Newton and all the laws he came up with and what's been learned since. Uh, but envisioning it is very difficult and we don't really have a clean way of doing that. But if you follow Einstein, the way you discuss it is in relativistic terms. And again, there may be some questions about why, for example, uh, large masses distort space in such a way that things move in, in the contours of that distorted space and that's what gravitation is, right? So uh, that's not a very satisfying answer, I suspect, but that's the way gravity is. Now we used to have, do we still have it? On a college where I once taught, they, there was a, a monument there um, <clears throat> which gave the college $1,500 if we would put the monument up. And it was to the Gravity Research Foundation. And it was basically saying, we don't know what this is. We need to find it out. And would you put this monument up so everybody realizes that, you know? So, so it's an enigmatic subject. Um, yeah, there, uh, 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 this guy's name was Babson, I believe. Oh, is that and, right? And uh, that prize is still given every year. Is it? Yeah. The, the, the problem with gravity is that we don't know how to quantize it. We have detected gravity waves, and the and these gravity waves, by necessity, are, are 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 quantized. But we do not understand how to how to quantize gravity, and uh, so so it's an incomplete. It's an incomplete but still classical theory. Yeah. Now it's also true that um, if I can. If I can come back here and just share my screen one more time here on this slide here. Uh, let me. All right, so these four fundamental forces, let me get them all in there. Now, these three, electromagnetism, weak nuclear and strong nuclear are all forces of the atom, right? They're tiny, tiny things. Uh, we saw how uh, Maxwell was able to unite electricity and magnetism into one force. Well, since then, electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force have been united into one force called the electroweak force. And so that means now there are three fundamental forces, gravity, the electroweak, and the strong nuclear. Now, if we're able to incorporate the strong nuclear force into one, if these three all get into one, then we're gonna have what's called a grand unifying theory. That would be then two fundamental forces, gravity and then these other, whatever that name would be called, right? That would be a grand unifying theory. And obviously are people trying to do that, I'm sure. However, what you notice is that gravity is the odd one out here. And we, as John says, we haven't been able to quantize gravity and incorporating gravity and all of these four fundamental forces into one, one force, one fundamental force would be a theory of everything. And you may have heard that term thrown around uh, now and again, dreams of a final theory, theories of everything. So that, that's, that's down the road, that's in the future, but that just kind of gives you an idea of how they relate to each other. But the, Three of them are all the atomic forces and the gravity is the odd one out, the big stuff. We are currently at 11. Um, some people have some more questions, but uh, this is the end of class. I, I, I'll leave it up to you, Dr. Gregory, if you want to take- Oh, that's fine. I'm fine. Time. As long as people want to stay, I'd be glad to. Okay. I will keep calling on questions then. Uh, up next, I see uh, Burns had their hand raised. Yes. So, uh, Fred. You want to uh, comment on the curious omission of Lisa Meitner from the Nobel Prize winner? Thanks, Ken, for that question. Uh, yeah, that's not a proud moment in our history, I don't think, that uh, she was so central. Um, at the time, of course, she's banned from Germany uh, on the sidelines. I'm afraid I have to say that I think the fact that she was a female also figures into why she didn't receive much more attention and credit. And there's, a, there's books on this. Uh, she didn't understand it either. Uh, so 
I mean, she and Han were very good friends, especially when they were working together in the lab before all of the war stuff started. They were very good friends. They, they, she was single, of course, she never married, but, but she and the, and the Hans, that is Otto and his wife and family would picnic together all the time and they enjoyed each other's company. They were good friends and that's why Otto Hahn tried to help her. But even after that, uh, if you read, I think it's, what's her first name? Syme is the last name, Ruth. Ruth Syme's book on Meitner will explain that Meitner felt a lot of this. She felt it very personally, even to the point of chastising Han on occasion for not equal treatment. So I'm sure women have a lot better time understanding how the dynamics of that kind of thing would work. But uh, the, the, there isn't a good explanation that I can come up with, Ken, as to why she hasn't been given more attention. Now, she, there, she has been the subject of a number of TV shows, et cetera, specials, documentaries, biographies, et cetera. And she did receive some prizes uh, later on in the 50s, but they weren't the Nobel, right? They were lesser prizes. Uh, I think the fact, that, go ahead. The fact that uh, she was Jewish didn't help her didn't help at all, no. no I certainly in Germany it didn't, but... Uh, uh, question in Sweden as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, good question. Those of you who are interested might want to look at Ruth Syme's book, which will help a lot get into the mind of Lisa Meitner. And I hope that in this presentation, you've seen how central she is to the story. I mean, she's the one that says, guess what, folks? Here's how it could be possible. And I think the just... Going over to your acquaintance Heisenberg, yeah, um, hey buddy. <laughs> he, uh, there's no question he was the uh, head of the German atomic bomb work yeah. group during the war, and so the the uh, the real question is whether the group actively tried to produce an atomic bomb or not. And well. I, I can tell you what he says. Yeah, what, what he says about that, and it's not unrealistic, I don't think. He says, um, at the time, it was a question of going along in some kind of minimal fashion or being dead. That was our options, right? Uh, if you resisted, for example. Uh, and so what his instructions were to his working group was, you know, whatever they, whenever they give you a task, uh, you know, you work with your head down, you don't do any more than you, you have to, to get by, but don't call any attention to yourself. That was his stance. Because we have to be around, somebody has to be around after this horribleness is over, when the war is done, and, and be there for the German scientific community. And he was obviously such a central part of that and had played such a major role in the theoretical advances of quantum mechanics that uh, those words have to be taken seriously, I think. He is, like John was saying, scientists are greeted, are given sometimes tasks that have these incredible implications for society. And they tend to see them first and foremost as a scientific challenge. Can you imagine, you know, if you're working on atomic fission or fusion for that matter, you say, we could do this, we could do that. Look what we could do. How would we do that? Why would that happen, et cetera? They're all caught up in that. That's what they're doing as scientists. And then they have to come to grips with the fact that this has terrible implications for us as human beings. So it's not an easy position to be put in. I have a certain amount of sympathy. Uh, there was an American attempt to assassinate Heisenberg you know, when he went to Switzerland and it, it, it foiled. It was not foiled so much as it didn't work for some reason. Um, and so, you know, there's all this dimension of it. But uh, I personally, I personally, while it's hard to forgive Heisenberg outright for the complicity he had, because he stayed and worked with the Nazis, he wore the uniform, etc. And even Bohr, they had a famous walk in September of 1939, in which um, Heisenberg is trying to get out of Bohr information about what the, what the Germans know, not what the Germans know, but what Meitner's done and what the Americans are doing, et cetera. And they came back from the walk prematurely 
Um, they didn't, they weren't speaking when they returned and Bohr's wife was astounded and Bohr just left. And that was a famous breach between the two of them um, for a while at any rate. And uh, it's become the subject of a play called Copenhagen by mm -hmm. Michael Frayn, F-R-A-Y-N, which you can read. And well, it's well worth seeing thing if you get a chance. <laughs> What's that? I say it's well worth seeing if you ever get the chance. Have you seen it? Yes. Oh, I have never seen it. I've, I've read it, but I've never seen it. Yeah. All right. Sorry to go on at length, but thanks for that question. S still on the subject of uh, women physicists getting credit, there is, there is a, an element named Curium. Yeah, there is. She, of course, also won a Nobel Prize. But uh, the, the, the question of naming new elements as they're found, the uh, uh, University of California had discovered a lot of the elements beyond plutonium. And, and one of them was named Berkelium. The yep. other one was named Lorentzium. They, they got on and on. Finally, there was a Seaborgium. And they, they keep going now. They're making they're making new elements by reversing the right. uh, uh, the, the fission pr uh, process by shooting in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in an accelerator to lower say say barium and something else a barium and iron and making just briefly for a, a few milliseconds or microseconds something that they can identify as as a new element. Right. And we're now up to element 109, I believe. And I think we're higher that, than that, aren't we? Huh? Seems to me we're higher than that. Okay, well, I forget what it is. But but uh, do you know what the name, what name they have given to that highest element? Uh, no, I don't know. There's Californium. I think there's Meitnerium. There's Einsteinium. Yes, yes, there is. So there are a number of these and you, if you think they, about the it, heaviest one known, they're, they're probably going to discover more. The heaviest one known is called mitnarium. Mitnarium. Oh, yeah. Well, you were getting to that. Sorry to steal yes. your thunder on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's a that's good point. Yeah. We didn't, I didn't talk about They're called the transuranic elements yes. because they're beyond uranium. Or actinides. Yeah. Sometimes yes. they're, actinides. They're, not, they're not. I guess some of them may occur naturally in nature. But for the briefest of moments, yes, yes they do. But it, you can create them. And yeah. if you think of a neutron in a nucleus as a combination of a proton and an electron, if you can get rid of the neutron, or I'm sorry, get rid of the electron and keep the neutron there, then you have essentially, well, I'm sorry, a neutron is a proton and an electron. If you get rid of the electron, you've added a proton to the nucleus. So that means you've got more than 92. So you're beyond uranium. And that's the kind of thing they do. Right. Right. Uh, we have we have chat questions. We have hand raises. It's eleven ten. I just want to check in with you again. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we do about two or three more questions? All right, and then we'll. Sounds great. Uh, so we have a chat question here from Eli Glazer that says, "Can you tick off the near miss accidents slash incidents that might have resulted in a nuclear explosion? What is the doomsday scenario?" Okay. I'll tell you what. I'm going to postpone that one because we're going to be talking about nuclear accidents in the last one, in the last session, we're gonna be talking about nuclear power, nuclear accidents and things like that. So that's a good place to, to deal with that. Uh, great, we have, a, we have another chat question. I'll just jump onto that one next. Uh, that says, what happened to Meitner eventually as an Austrian of Jewish background? I think she eventually moved to, to England, if I'm not mistaken, I'm remembering. My mind isn't as quick. I need that, that stuff they advertise on TV. Uh, what is that stuff? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I need. Uh, but right. my, my recollection is she she moved to England a lot of part of her life. She was in Cambridge, I think. Well, she yeah. Okay, that could be. Uh, we have a hand raised. Uh, I uh, I believe Paula Crowley was next, and then we will go to Bob okay. Bernstein, and then we will end it there. Okay. Bob, go, Bob, go ahead. You were, you've been there first. I'll go last. <laughs> if 
We can't, I'm not hearing you. Is it me? Who were the major players in the Soviet Union? Oh, you mean later? Yeah. Uh, Sakharov, what's his name? Sakharov. Sakharov, yeah. He's the, the, the biggest one that I know of. Uh, that's a whole different story. That takes us to the John. I'm sorry. I Bob, we, there's a lot of noise coming from your end. Do you... All right. I've temporarily muted Bob uh, okay. so we can answer this question first. Sorry, Bob. And then we'll unmute you when for your question. Maybe you can put it in the chat if we have a problem. Yeah, if you send it in the chat, I can I can answer that right next. That's good. Paula, do you want to go in the interim there? Yes, uh, I was wondering if there were um, isotopes of elements other than hydrogen that were considered um, for these uh, fusion reactions. I'm not aware of that because the hydrogen into helium fusion is so pervasive in nature where stars are concerned. That that's the process. Uh, now, what you may be talking about there, there I'm sorry, I take that back. In getting the heavier elements, when you look at scenarios of the um, development of the universe, all right, there is a an initial big bang we assume, and then there's this tremendous expansion. We're in the realm of theology here, incidentally, <laughs> when we're talking about this, because who knows for sure. But the best scenarios we have suggest that there at the beginning was this fluid flux. Um, and it was mostly ions of things. And then as they coalesce, uh, you get the helium, the, the hydrogen to helium reaction. And then you begin to get different kinds of fusion to produce the heavier elements. And that's why, for example, you hear scientists say in special programs about the Big Bang that we are made of stars because it's when stars are formed and the thermonuclear reactions that take place on them create the heavier elements. So that you, you're right, there must be fusion at higher levels than the helium, hydrogen into helium. Uh, and that's what produces the heavy elements. That process is studied and a lot of people know a lot about it. I'm not one of them, however, but I do know that it happens. So you're right, uh, there is fusion of other, other elements. Yes, all, all, of the, all of the elements, all the naturally occurring elements were made in the sun, except for helium. Helium was made uh, in the very beginning before there were any stars, but the, but the rest of the rest of the elements were made in stars by these same, these same kind of thermonuclear reactions that we're talking about. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Lance, do we have that question? Um, is not in the chat. Do you wanna try a meeting again? Uh, oh, here it is, perfect. Okay, great. Perfect timing, Bob, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so Bob Bernstein's question is, what is happening to explain how the strong nuclear force works? Um, I don't know. I, I think that here's the way I envision it. Don't take this as an explanation because it's not going to be one, right? But I see it as in some sense an interlocking of things that is under tremendous pressure. And that if you are able to snap that, because it only acts in very short range. That's the key thing. That's not an explanation of what you're asking for at all, but it's how I envision it that makes any sense whatsoever <laughs> because I, I have to think of it, it's so close, the protons are packed in there. So how can they be bonded together? There must be some kind of connection like that that is snapped, right? And uh, I don't know how it works. John, do you have any light on this? Well, the, the, uh, the, the, first, uh, the first model of, of, of uh, uh, nuclear fission was called the liquid drop model, which you referred to. And it, and it was entirely classical. It, it turns out that a, a, dro a drop of water is, is kept together by something called 
surface tension. And if you now imagine that you have a drop of water that has an electric that is electrically charged. Then the then the, the, the electrical charge wants to wants to pull the water apart, and, the, and it, but it's held together by this surface tension. That is exactly a model that had been worked out prior to nuclear uh, uh, fission. And that was the one that was first applied to understand how uh, how elements can break apart. The liquid drop model. Yeah. All right. Sorry, that's not really. I mean, that helps. It helps me a lot, too. So, well, OK. I think, Lance, we probably can call it because these people have been very, very patient. So. Uh, yeah, so let's let's thank Fred again. I think he's done a marvelous job of of uh, ex explaining the d development of uh, nuclear uh, nuclear power, and we're waiting for him next next week to talk about nuclear holocausts. Yes, in film and and literature, yes. and I'm sure a number of you have already been there. Uh, how many of you have read on the beach? Yeah, lots of you have. Yeah, that was one that really profoundly shook shook me yeah. as a as a teenager. And I, and the movie is even more. Yeah, special. who is that? Gregory Peck. Yeah. 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 And Fred Astaire. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I will leave you until next week. Thank you again for coming. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.